talk that I would like uh, to share with you and some insight that I would like uh, to share with all of you today is about the processing chain uh, that is beyond uh, the satellite. doesn't matter if it was Prisma that you, you probably have the presentation this morning and then in the afternoon you will have some information about the image analysis but the, the truth is that there are many things happening behind the data set from the moment that the satellite is acquired information and acquisition. And then to the moment that you yourself uh, selecting uh, to uh, implement the, uh, your algorithm and to run any kind of processing scheme on the hyperspectrum. So this talk is a, in a way a bridge from what was presented in the morning and a little bit more because uh, the market is changing. The, the vision of, uh, of remote sensing is changing because uh, more and more you will see in the next few, few years a large constellation of satellites, some of them with hyperspectral, some of them with star. And there are not just one satellite, there are many satellites. Like in our case, 100 satellites, you can imagine. Wow, so many, what does it mean? So I will try to, to provide more information about that. But the most important all the time to put uh, of, of everything that I will explain today is that you need to be aware every time on, on the data and how the data is acquired, uh, which type of process was implemented before you select and or, or collecting the data to work on, because this might influence quite drastically on, on what you decide to do with the data. So what I will provide to you today, so it's some just like preliminary definition that we all of us stand and understand a uh, different type of uh, uh, element in the processing chain. I will explain the processing chain. What, what does this mean when a big space agency are saying, this is our processing chain? Uh, then we discuss on different elements on the processing chain about the image acquisition and hyperspectral, uh, which type of enhancement and radiometric correction they are implementing, what is the cloud mask and why they are collecting it and the georectification. What does it mean atmospheric correction and what do I gain in the end of the process? And just really one, two slides, really short line, one on my advice, my professional advice related to image processing if you take it further, because this is not the main topic of this talk today. So let's dive. By the way, if I'm talking too quickly, because I have sometimes the tendency to do that, then somebody just interfere or raise a hand or whatever and just say, hey, this is too quick. So I will try Sorry, to... Sorry, Michal. Uh, yeah. it, is there any way you can uh, put the volume a little up? Higher? Uh, yes. A little low. Do you hear me now better? Yes. Alba? Yes. Okay. So this is the top now, what we call. I cannot do okay. more. Okay. I am actually screaming in my ears now. So sorry for that. Um, so I I believe that you maybe saw partly or similar image about uh, this hyperspectral, but this hyperspectral. I would like to remind all of you that there is a reason why you're using this very large amount of data. And the reason is physics is the spectroscopy behind it. The idea is to identify and to characterize the physics and the chemistry behind the, the element that you are measuring or acquired from the satellite or from the airborne. The hyperspectral is the spectrometer, but with an imaging, it's an optical system, and it's measure specific wavelength or uh, wave range with many narrow spectral band. Many people say hyperspectral, it's just many spectral band, but the truth is that it's not. It needs to be more than 30 bands indeed. However, what is the most important thing in hyperspectral is the continuous measurement along the spectrum. It can be that you will select very narrow wave range, for example, only 400 to 600, and you will locate the 100 spectral band. The most important about it is that those bands will be continuously measuring with an overlap. It means that there will not be any break in, between, in the middle. When there is, a break of wavelength in between the wavelength. This means that it's not anymore hyperspectral. This is actually multispectral because multispectral is not just a matter of number of band. This information is very important because this is the core of the knowledge and the insight behind hyperspectral. If for any reason somebody's taking 500 spectral band or 150 spectral band and then reduce it 
to only 10 bands in here and located in different type of spectrum, then I don't understand at all the need even to collect hyperspectral. The idea in hyperspectral is to be able to identify the absorption feature of specific material. And this means that we are selecting for specific, like in the case here of the wavelength, specific absorption feature that is located. It might be very narrow. And the only way to identify it is with this with continuous measurement along the spectrum. So this is just something to put in mind. Before we continue further, unfortunately for all of us, we need to define some basic, uh, uh, I will call it basic definition or basic, uh, basic coordination between us. I will repeatedly mention it, but we need just to be sure, all of us, that we understand what, what does it mean. You can see on the left side of, of, uh, of my slide, uh, actually the Mount Everest, somewhere down in the troposphere, and uh, it can be aircraft and it can be satellite over it. And I would like to measure, uh, I don't know, uh, any kind of uh, object that is now on Mount Everest. Everything that is above me, doesn't matter which level of it is at the atmosphere, this consider as atmosphere. The satellite itself, most of the time, the Earth observation, they will, be, they will collect data most of the time in the LEO, so around between 450, I would say, to, six, to 700 kilometer. Still, all the area that consider from the satellite until the Mount Everest, this will consider as an atmosphere. The information, the reference, the data that is collected in this, on the satellite itself with the detector is considered as the top of the atmosphere, is a TOA. And what the detector is collecting is what we call the flux of the energy that is reaching to this detector. And it depends on the wavelength. So every time that I will describe any kind of light energy that is measured in the detector, it will be defined per different type of wavelength. We also should define what is irradiance. Irradiance, it means that this flex is collected to specific area. So if my target is around Mount Everest and in the swath of the image, I'm seeing Mount Everest and some area around it, I would say that the amount of energy, the flux that was collected to this surface unit inside of my swath. Irradiance, most of the time referring to the solar illumination, because now we are speaking about the reflective domain, everything that is under three micrometer or 3,000 nanometer. And what you see in the image here is what is very common to the solar illumination at the Toa, which means this very high peak that look actually only as the energy very known along the spectrum of a sun, sun energy. We should also define what is radiance, because I will many times mention radiance and I will mention reflectance. Radiance is this flux that is measured in a unit, but per specific perpendicular to the surface of the optics. So now I'm integrating the information that is related to my camera, to the optic itself. And this means that what I'm measuring in the radiance is the direct, because it's, it's the solid angle perpendicular. So the direct flux going to my detector, but this is also considered in the aperture of the camera. So I now already consider information that is related to the mechanics, related to the hardware that I'm using, detector and camera. So this is radiance. We have just to, rem to remember this type of information because we will use it further. What is bottom of the atmosphere? So the Everest is in the bottom of the, uh, the atmosphere. It means that it's referred to the energy that reflect from the Earth surface. Earth surface can be water or can be, of course, the continent. And this is again measured to the wavelength. What is reflect under three, three uh, micrometer? It means from the visible to the near to the near and the sphere one and the sphere two infrared that is dependent on the solar illumination, that's why it's going to refer to reflective, is the radiance that reflect out from the land and the water to, to the detector. So just to put in mind, again, summary, top of the atmosphere, it's what we're measuring at the detector already at the satellite, and the bottom of the atmosphere will be referring to the reflectance after we have then to remove all this atmosphere information, and we would like only to know what is reflected from the target itself, 
because what I'm looking actually from the satellite is for the target. I'm not looking for the target plus the atmosphere. I would like to know only information about the target itself. When one is referring to hyperspectral processing chain, we should remember, and, and this is the example that I'm giving here, it's a processing chain that move, that starting from the acquisition and is referring until the moment that the image is corrected or rectified. It means that it's already passed several processes like radiometric, geometric, atmospheric correction. And there it's full process of rectification and correction. This is the processing chain. The high level info of information, whatever you will be imply or any kind of product production is another service that most of the time the satellite uh, data provider or the company, they would not provide it to you unless you will pay any kind of services or level of, of processing, which is already two or three level of processing from what they given as a basic information. But most of the time, what you will see also in Prisma is this free level of correction, which is after image acquisition in a row, you would have a geometric correction. We will give arrive to it in a detail, geometric correction and atmospheric correction. And this is the processing chain. And what I will try to break with you now is actually those type of, of information, those type of stages of information. So the first one is related in hyperspectral to the image acquisition. The third, we, as you remember from, from the first slide, we mentioned that there is hyperspectral. Hyperspectral on the satellite is, of course, depend on the detector itself and the camera. But to collect the data, we need a moving object. This moving object, most of the time, is our satellite itself. So we collect the data when the satellite is moving uh, in orbit. In most of the cases, we will arrive to the snapshot in a second. This process is considered as a scanning, acquisition along a scanning. There are three different types of scanning. One of them, as you see on the left side, is called whisk broom. This is very common, mainly for military. It's an area with only one pixel. Why the military is doing it? Because the area, when it's only one pixel, you can then improve highly the spatial resolution you have all the light and enter gather to one pixel. So you can have a very good signal to noise ratio. But what you need to know to, to, to do to develop one image is to move in the, the, the all the spatial dimension. It means you can move in the X, di X dimension or the Y dimension. You already have all the information on your area for all the spectrum that you are collecting. This is called whisk broom, And it's very rare to have this type of uh, of data or availability outside of the military. The most common, which is also Prisma, is the push broom, or also known as the line scanner. So on the line scanner, we have actually a line of all, uh, of uh, a cube of, of hyperspectra, that the movement along the line, along the X and the Y, along the movement of the satellite, is creating the imaging. So that's the reason why it's called line scanning. The movement of the push broom is because it's swapping from, from actually to the end of the Y, then back like a brush. And that's why the name of push broom. Spectral scanning is one that is just appearing in the last few years. And this is mainly related to the linear filter type of methods. What we are measuring, we have like already the spatial acquisition, I would call it the shape that is what is the image. And what I'm creating band by band by um, by the movement of the satellite is actually band by band of the wavelength. This is very uh, unique. You can think about it that if I have a coops hyperspectral like of Prisma, in a way I'm just like turning to another side of the cube. So I will have the image, but in different direction. The new capability that appearing now in the market and that many of you in the next few years probably have an access to this data is called a snapshot. This is type of like a Cuba. You can imagine that I already have all uh, the, the all the cube of the hyperspectral. I will have the three dimension, the X and Y and the spectra. And what then I'm taking, I'm taking in one shot, like a video, many shot of, of, of the imaging when the satellite is moving. In this case of acquisition, the movement of the satellite is actually an artifact. We would prefer, of course, that the satellite would just stand still, but this is impossible. 
So this is something that we have to take into account. So to overcome it, what we are doing, we are measuring or collecting many, many types of, of, uh, of hyperspectral cube. In the, in the case of Cuba, for example, we're collecting 50 hypercube per second. So you can imagine how many uh, images we're collecting when the, 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 the satellite is moving. In a sense, we're trying to overcome this after, artifact of the movement, but what we're collecting in the same time, in one shot, is this cube completely of the spectrum uh, uh, over a specific uh, object or target. I mentioned in already pr Prisma, and I mentioned in different type of satellite. And I just said that uh, what what we foreseen in the next uh, in the next few years, and we seen like in the last two and three years of development, is the market and the civilian market is moving from a very large hi uh, hyperspectral satellite that are push broom, enormous one like Prisma, like Nmap that we will discuss in a second, to a small and large constellation of a snapshot. So we mentioned, and you, you had this morning like uh, already um, like a study about the Prisma, uh, and this is Italian satellite. And please see what is the satellite mass of, of, of this uh, Prisma. It's 830 kilogram. The Nmap that is just going already launched more than like half a year ago, and everybody waiting that they will start to release data that promise now in the end of October, beginning of November is 980 kilogram. As you notice, both of them have about 30 meter ground resolution. They are only passing the revisit time, it's about once a month. Actually, their uh, technology is about 20, more than 20 years old. You can see a new one, a new constellation in a way of a 12 unit satellite that uh, is now going to release by US. It's called HiSpec IQ. And those have also sat mass of 600. They're also covering the vis near infrared until the sphere. It's mean about 350 or 400 nanometer to 2,500 nanometer. The grand resolution already of the new generation of this big satellite from the US, they are only five meter. The same thing, for example, for other like Pixel that now is releasing. But those are snapshot. They are small like Kuva. We will discuss how small they are. You have also Satellogic, we are expecting like a satellite of 40 kilogram and 25 uh, gram resolution. But you can see the one of Kuva. Kuva from Finland have a mass, and we discussed it's very small, it's like a shoebox. And it's only, the mass of the satellite is only 24. You can enter almost all our constellation in the size of, of, uh, of what is the size of Nmap or, or Prisma. And this satellite have a ground resolution that is better than 10 meter. And the predicted, it's when all the constellation will be in place, is that they will pass over some places on Earth even about three times a day. So this enormous capability of collecting large amount of hyperspectral data so many times a day, it's something that is very, uh, it's of course enriching and it's very important, but it's also have a cost on the processing chain. And this is what we'll discuss today. So why somebody need a satellite like, like Prisma? And then you can see it inside. You can see the detector. This is a page from, 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 uh, of Prisma, from ASI. You can see the complication of all the different part, part of the slit, the free detector, the veneer, the swear, and then you have the panchromatic, you have the gratin, uh, in, uh, the gratin platform, the slit, the mirrors. All these are creating the technology of the detector itself. But those detectors, they need two things that were in that time very heavy and very big, and that's why the heavy mass. And first is the power because of the cooling of the system. The sphere need a very good cooling. So at that time, there was no serogenic cooling on the detector itself. So it's created with this also capability, all the different parts of the optic. But what is the most important is the stabilization. So to stabilize this big detector, you need very large, big uh, capacity around it. To, to protect it in the space and to assure that no, no part will, will move, et cetera. Imagine this 980 gram or 890 gram, uh, uh, kilogram, sorry, of a push boom imaging moving to a snapshot imaging. I'm showing you just an example. So imagine now a shoebox, very nice shoebox, <laughs> that inside you have the 
image sensor, you have the spectral filter, and then you have high resolution optic. What is very easy about that is that you can just change the spectral filter and without you can already have different type of web range and you can still collect data with a 250 spectral band between 400 to 2,500 nanometer. What is very interesting about the snapshot that you can now do actually with the, with the normal scanning is that in, with, for example, with our camera, you can also have through the constellation or, or through changing uh, the field of view, you can have a stereo capability. You can have what we call staring. Staring is mean like three satellites or more will stare at the same time on the same direction. So this you can help you to improve the signal to noise ratio, uh, ratio sorry. And what is the most important, I, I just mentioned it before, what all those snapshot uh, uh, satellites will be able to do is to have many cube hyperspectral at, uh, at the, uh, for, for second. So what they can create is super resolution. It means that I can improve the spatial resolution and the signal to noise ratio by having many of those cube hyperspectral collecting over a specific area on the earth in just one second. So this capability is a new capability, is now appearing. Uh, 2023 going to be a rich year for, for many of those companies, and you should expect uh, more than 100 uh, hyperspectral satellites from different type of uh, service provider all over the world in the beginning, already Q1 and Q2 of 2023. So how this is just an example of how look the, the constellation. So of course you can see like uh, like only one coop satellite appearing, but what is impressive is that when you have a, a constellation, the speed and the rapidity of uh, data that might be collected over Earth, of course, and, and providing this type of information. Doesn't matter if you have a very large satellite or if you have a very small satellite. Of course, very small satellite have a less space, have a limited of power. But even in the case of Prisma, although we're this very huge, actually like the size of my salon flying uh, on, on space, have a limited of power and a limited of storage on board. So most of the time what happens is that the, the data will be compressed. So the solution will be compressed. Most of the time they will use a JPEG Excel after principal component analysis for hyperspectral. This is to allow uh, to reduce ray distortion. But of course, what is the most important is to preserve the spectral information. And most of the data then on board of the satellite are compressed and then download uh, into the ground station. But before it's downloaded into the ground station, to be able to do what we are going to discuss now in, in the next hour is the metadata. What is it, this metadata? It's all the information that we will need now to create our processing chain. It means that we, all information about the satellite, what is its orbit number, you know it yourself if you look in the XML of, of hyperspectral or any kind of satellite data, if it's Sentinel or other, the altitude, the ground pixel, you have information about the wavelength and the web band. You have information how many array there are from the detector. What is the position and the velocity? What is the instrument status and its temperature? Because this can dramatically uh, influence on the radiometric correction. And then also the start on the stop of the acquisition. All this information is downloaded as quickly as possible, most of the time using at the moment in X-ray um, data into uh, a ground uh, a segment detection. In the ground station, what is very, very important, most of the time, the good one, they will have what you call space meteorological station, and then they will stamp the, the data, the header of the data with the solar zenith angle that is very important uh, information uh, for the atmospheric correction. Maybe what I will do now, uh, before I continue further, is just to ask if you have until now any question, and if they would know, I will continue further. Uh, no questions from here, from the audience? Yes, there is one question, sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hello, Michal. Um, hey. I'm, I was wondering um, uh, what, what was the, how many bits the images, uh, thinking about storage, Oh, very good question. So, for example, uh, of Kuva, so every cube hyperspectral have uh, two, 240 bits. But it's changing. I don't know to tell you exactly for, for Prisma, 
but uh, for Prisma, it's of course higher because they're measuring over a long uh, dis uh, distance, a long swath. But I cannot really tell you this. I can answer only for Kuva. Um, saying that, you're completely right. So this is the major issue that is the storage. And um, company will try to keep as much as they can storage in physical to control the, the access to the data. But there will be no other choice but most of the data to save over, over cloud capacity. Okay, thank you very much. There is uh, one more question from the audience. Okay, okay. Hi, Michal. Thank you for your presentation. Hey. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, I think I missed something in the middle. Um, okay. Maybe I, I didn't I will hear. Show you. Okay. Because you, you said that, uh, that you showed us a table where yes, I'm going there back. were I'm going different type of satellites. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Different. The Google Space units on are they on space already yes. or no, no. So they actually the <laughs> one of Kuva Space will be launched the first one now in Q1. Okay. In 2026 we will have 45. In 2030 we will have 100. Okay. But if you go to high spec IQ, in Q1 they will have six. Okay. Satellogic have already six and going to 12 next year. China, the, the Orbita have at the moment six, and they're going to reach 12 in the beginning of 2024. Okay. And what you see, like for example, Pixel, they already have seven in orbit, and they intend to launch 36. Now I will explain how we do it. I just explained that the satellite is very small. I, I really hope that you're hearing me well and there is no echo. So the satellite is very small, and uh, for example, in our case, it's SpaceX that launched the satellite. So uh, I don't know if you saw it once. So the rocket is, is uh, entering into orbit and then it's throwing out uh, in each position of the orbit one of our satellites. In total, every couple of months, we will launch six satellites. So every two months, we will use SpaceX to launch six satellites and to throw it like a bus. It's just passing into orbit and then throwing the satellite in the different location. Perfect, cool. thank you. Yeah, yeah, very cool. <laughs> there is a lot of wow ooh, here. <laughs> okay, so anyway, thank you. If, you, if you're ready, I will continue because yes. what I will do every time that I will uh, pass over a specific topic, I will stop and then we will see if you have any questions. Is this okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, so I will continue. Yes, perfect, sorry. <laughs> so, Ali, so let's start. So. I mentioned in the beginning, whatever you, you have in the data, I will give some advice in the end. You, you have to understand a little bit what uh, you receive in the data. What is exactly the processing behind, behind this data? Because this will influence dramatically on your processing chain. You can, on your, on your processing, you can ask uh, Alba and Abela and definitely Veronica that is, is near you, but some of you already know it yourself. Uh, you don't know why sometimes it's working, uh, why not, why data look as it is, why atmospheric correction changing all the results here and there. And maybe here's some, some answer, but it's very important to know those things. So let's start from the beginning. What is between, we acquired the data, the data was already in the ground station. Now it's in our storage, it was uh, delivered, it was transferred to our storage. What do I have there and what is the first stage that I'm doing? So the first stage that I'm calling it, it's from row to radiance. What is the row? The row is the digital number. So the flux, you can see here the hyperspectral uh, cube, this specific one that we will use today for the demonstration is a data that collected over Barcelona. Why? Because Alba was there and I decided to show the cube of Barcelona. So, and it was taken in 24th January, 2020 when Alba was not there, but never mind. But anyway, still, what, what do you see here is, is just in the end. So the cube is still in the end. Uh, it's mean a digital number. So the flux is just presented in a gray scale between zero to 255, but it, you can still, you, you can already have an image. Okay, you can almost do nothing with this image. It's a still raw data. You still need at least the radiance to, to start to process the data, but there will be also a, a long process uh, before it. So 
What I would like to present today is what we are doing as a first stage. So what most of the company will do, they will do image announcement and they will do some more geometric correction. If we compare between what the push broom, what you need to do, for example, for an image like they are doing for Prisma, okay, as a push broom, and what you will do for snapshot. So for Prisma and for snapshot, for push broom and for snapshot, you will need to uh, correct the pixel. Although from the example that I will show you now, Prisma is not doing it. You will need to do it yourself. So that's why I gave this example. However, optical distortion correction, they are doing, and they are doing in any case. For snapshot, we will need also to do band alignment and image stitching. And most of the time, the data uh, provider will do it. So Kuva, for example, will do all the steps. And radiometric correction also have to be done by the data provider. But you need to know how they're doing it because this, as I mentioned, is a very a crucial, important part that you can already work on the data. And I would actually advise you in the end to do so. So, the first thing is bad pixel correction. I'm sure some of you that sit in here on the t uh, today, or maybe you will have some exercise this afternoon, you will see Prisma image. And a Prisma image in different band, now you are observing already three band, but one of those band suffer from bad pixel. The bad pixel of Prisma most of the time appear as a line, bad line or bad row, okay? And if you will zoom, if you check the, the, the spectrum of this specific bad pixel, it can be only one or the line, you will see really completely different profile that is uh, dropping down to zero, and at least on specific band, where the band in the same time, like if you're seeking here in 1,500, have to be very high. The, the, the level of the radiance, the data value have, have to be very high. So this we are calling bad pixels. So most of the time it will appear as very dark black, only one or longer, uh, several of them or group of them. What you need to do to continue to uh, uh, process further, most of the time is to correct it. As I mentioned before, Prisma is not doing it. You will have to do it. The correction is basically straightforward. What you're doing, you're doing most of the time average around neighboring pixel. So you can have the pixel here in D, any kind of value like 40 which is, uh, sorry, it will be zero, but all the value around it is, is 40 or 45 or 42, or 45. You will create around it or with four, or most of the time we call it kernel of eight around it, uh, neighboring pixel to improve the central value of the pixel. In the case of Prisma, what you will see most of the time is a line, is two line or three or four line, one after another that are a bad line. What you have to do is the way that I, I implemented here, that you can see here, you actually taking the neighboring pixel of the two side and, and in between of those lines and making an average to correct each band separately. You will need to do that because if you will implement further, further your, uh, your algorithm or the processing chain, you all the time will appear, this black value will appear and distort uh, uh, not just the visual, but also effect of some of, of, the active, of the processing that you are doing. The second one, which is very, very important, and that you will see sometime in, uh, in some data, I'm sure, with, at least with the new satellite, is the optical distortion, which is related to the camera itself. This you cannot change. This has to be done by the, by the data provider. And this, what it's creating is like we know for some imaging of, of camera, normal camera, is what you call uh, this, this uh, uh, dichotermia, dichotermia of the image itself, of the lens itself. And this can be, as I mentioned, corrected by uh, the data provider, but this still has to be done. So if you are observing and, and it can happen, is because you acquired the image that still a process was not implemented. Now, if we are looking at snapshot, I, I just explained snapshots. Imagine they're taking CubeSat, okay, Cube Hyperspectral, sorry, Cube Hyperspectral in one time. So I have now an image of, of, of uh, Barcelona one time. I actually will have it in, in the second that I'm speaking 50 times. But all the bands, all the band of the Cube is already, are already acquired. However, even how quick we are taking the snapshot, like in, in, in a video, we are not quick enough. So it means until the moment that the satellite is already moving, it might be that between the first band to the last band, I have a small distortion that integration time was having a, a small delay. And this causing what you see on the background around is where the image become to be blurry. 
you see this rainbow most of the time appearing like a kind of color rainbow in, in between the band and mainly in the, in, in the border. And you will see what we call ghost effect. Ghost effect is, uh, imagine that if, I mean, we are now measuring from satellite, we don't have this resolution, but if you're thinking uh, that I will zoom now to a plant and due to the wind between the first image to the last one, the leaves will move, this will create a ghost effect. In this case of a satellite, you can imagine about moving object like aircraft or, or, or car. So if they will move, every, everything will start to appear a little bit as a ghost effect. So what then you are doing? So I gave an information here of it's called SIFT. I didn't give the image of Barcelona because if I, I tried it and I will show you the result in a second. It was more uh, difficult to, uh, to present to you the result. But imagine what I'm doing, I'm taking each band. So each band is a grayscale band by itself. Of course, only when we are superimposed them together uh, in RGB, then we are seeing the color. But as a gray, we are looking for feature. We are looking at value in the grayscale where we are then, we are first identify features. So identify uh, any kind of region or value that we would like and we're finding the same one on the same image. And what we're creating is we're creating like a, a match, a sift. We are trying to find how they are uh, connected to each other. They have the same value, the same shape, and it's called environment feature transform. So first what we are doing, so we identify the one that are appearing in A and the one that are appearing in B. And then what we're doing, we just apply an affine transformation, a simple affine transformation. You can do it on the first polynomial. By doing it, what it will do, it will make this correction that you will see now. So the image that was before very blurry and changing starts suddenly to be a little bit brighter and, and the information become to be sharper. This something that the data provider will have to, to do. But I hope that Kuva will never give data that is not corrected. But if you will, in the future, I mean next year, seeing any result that are still blurring, what you need to do is to actually detach the different bands to create those kind of feature selection and to uh, affin back uh, the band alignment. You could also use the sift to create another thing, the stitching, because uh, the CoopSat, okay, uh, like Kuva is using and Satologic will use next year. I mentioned they are very small. It means that the aperture itself is very narrow. It means that the swath on the ground will be very narrow. And as it's not collecting like a, a line, like a push broom, like a continuous long image, what you will need to do is you will need to stitch like you, uh, you can do in urban uh, photo. So in uh, like in urban photo, what you need to do is again to identify those zone using the SIFT uh, uh, algorithm to identify feature and then to match the feature one to another to be able to create a long information uh, along uh, an image and, and then to have for all the area of interest, a full complete imaging using the large amount of the coupe hyperspectral that was collected. The last but not least, but the most important is the radiometric correction. All of you are hearing about the radiometric correction. Radiometric correction can most of the time be done only by the data provider. It's mean different type of distortion. It can be optical distortion, which we call optical aberration. It can be dark current due to the temperature. We mentioned it before that most of the time in the metadata, we will collect what is the temperature of the sensor. Vignetting spectral distortion. Spectral distortion can be that suddenly specific band is not collected or you can have spectral shift. It's mean that instead of uh, any kind of radiance will be uh, uh, measured in 2.4, it's actually have like due to any kind of problem or even a movement that was on the satellite, actually like it was collected in, in the band before. All this information is collected and how you can correct it. You cannot do it, the, the data provider will do that. And they're using it, what we call a lookup table. It's information about the integration time, about the illumination information, but what, and most important, if I mentioned it before, the difference between irradiance and the radiance, I'm taking information of the aperture itself, of the camera. And this, how it's done, we are collecting large amount of, of many tests, benchmarking test information using the camera in different light condition in the laboratory. We collect in this lookup table and we implement it automatically on every image, every cube image that is collected. What will be transformer now 
is that information that was before as dn is now presented as a radiance. And what you will see, you will start already to see differences in the spectrum, although they are still in radiance and not in reflectance, not the one absorption feature that you know for, for vegetation, but you see the difference with, between vegetation, for example, industrial roof and water. I would like you to put it in mind. So you might not see again the absorption feature of the red edge and the chlorophyll. You might not see uh, the, the peak of, of specific uh, aluminum material, or we won't see the absorption feature in the blue of the water as necessary, but nevertheless, we would be able using this radiance already to see differences between material in the radiance domain, it's mean in the term. Guys, again, I'm coming back to you. I'm speaking, speaking, speaking. I just would like to know if somebody have a question before I'm moving on. Uh, thank you, Michal. Is there any question of the audience? Yes, we have one question. Hi, Michal. Um, Hi. Very nice, very clear the presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the when you say that you should identify features to, to make this teaching. Yeah. Uh, how do you do automatically with machine learning or how do you do that? Yeah, part? you're using. No, yeah, you have to use machine learning. So what you're doing, you're measuring two things. You're measuring in the grayscale the the value of the grayscale, okay? Because they have to be they they were collected so so much near each other. So I collected 50 bands, 50 cubans in seconds. So the value have to be there was no la large differences in the illumination. So I expected the grayscale value to be quite similar. But another thing that is the most important using pattern recognition, I would identify features shape. So I am collecting, for example, if you see there, you see the round shape, etc. So can I identify those ones? And then what he's doing is doing stitching in two levels. One of them is gray, and one, and the second one is the shape. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there any more questions? No. I have uh, only one question. Uh, you talk about um, the narrow uh, swat of the yes yeah. satellite how how narrow is it like so we can uh do you have those okay. numbers so the for example kuva space is uh have a the area itself is 2000 and 2000 pixel and we will collect data uh, from uh, uh 350 kilometer so it means that uh, we will probably have a swath i would say of uh uh 17 kilometer on 17 kilometer for each cube okay okay thank you i think we can continue yes. ah we yes sorry continue. no no it's okay it's okay okay so let's go so i will again i want to do the slideshow okay so what is the next level? So we, we now have data that are in radians. And most of the time, like, for, by the way, for example, for Prisma, Prisma most of the time doing gel rectification be, before they, they uh, actually doing radiometric correction. It's, it's a selection, it's a choice, you can do that. But most of the data provider will first uh, um, transform into radians, and I will tell you why, because the stage of the radians it's so important that you're trying to minimize as much as you can the implementation, any kind of implementation on the data, to try to keep the DN, what we call, pure as possible. Indeed, in georectification, you're not supposed to change the value of the data, but just the idea that something might, might wrong in the process, as you can imagine, during the process, you might have any kind of problem in the processing chain. They are not taking a chance with that, and they are preferring to implement most of the process after uh, the data is already in radiance. I'm just reminding you in Prisma, for example, it's done uh, earlier. So what is the next step? The next step is, for, is first called the cloud mask. The cloud mask will mainly need to provide the data provider, the data user, sorry, how much cloud, because they have such a significant uh, distortion on the image. Uh, and also it's very important for the atmospheric correction that will come after. And then it's implemented a gerectification. We will describe each one of them in a detail. 
So cloud mask. Why at all I need any kind of information of clouds? All of you that work with optical data, you know how much it's annoying when finally Prisma is covering the area of Argentina and half of the image is full with, is covered by cloud. Cloud and cloud shadow can destroy completely the, the spectrum because they're of course blocking the light and then this, the amount of information coming out from this picture from this uh, pixel, sorry, is completely diminished. We are seeing only flat or very low and incorrect uh, measurement of the light or the, of, of the absorption feature that is on the ground. The most of the time we'll know by the orbit and by any kind of information that provided from meteorological if there was any kind of also snow. So snow is the first thing that you're doing because you need to separate between snow and, and cloud. Two of them will, the white of the cloud and of the snow, will reflect data in a sense so high that it will cause intensity. So this will be too much. And even if you will convert it to the radiance, it will like overtone the information that you have as a signal inside of the image. We, we will show an example in a, in a second what is the shadow of the mask. This also been collected or light has or heavy has and the cloud mask is basically supposed to give information about how thick is the cloud. If the cloud is so thick that it's creating a shadow, the shadow itself is also supposed to be considered with cloud. The only thing that they're doing in these steps is that they are not removing the clouds. So we are not just masking really out, we are just trying to mask to have an ID, quick estimation of how much cloud cover we have in the, in the scene itself and to provide it to the data uh, user that he will decide, he or she, if they would like to continue further to acquire the, uh, the data or even to work further with it. So how it all look like uh, in the spectrum of a cloud? You, you see the cloud here is a, as a continuation. This is the soil and this is the cloud. This is all information, this is reflectance by the way, that had from different type of feature that are in this scene. You can see clearly what's happened to an area that is agricultural area, that instead that we will see the absorption feature of vegetation, the only thing that we see is see that is this white cloud, white uh, reflectance that's coming and it's a continuous spectrum. The cloud here clearly are very thick because when they are thick, they create heavy shadow on the area next to them, it's called cloud shadow. This cloud shadow will appear in a lower, if, if the white cloud has a high reflectance, the, the shadow, of course, will not just uh, this, uh, diminish completely the absorption feature of the specific spectrum, the level of the reflectance will be also very low, the level of the radiance will be very low. How we are doing it? So, most of the data user, and I guess also you, you will use what you can open source. There are many open source of different type of cloud masks. Some of you using the send to core of Sentinel, Prisma using the send to core for Sentinel. You remember this cloud, we can see now those clouds. You can see the white cloud and you can see the, the shadow. If you can see now the performance of different type of, of cloud masks, like S2 Cloudless, the Maja, or some that is very common in the data user, the F mask 4. You can see why F mask 4 become to be uh, very good and very popular because this is the only one that managed to detect quite well the, shadow, the, the cloud and also the shadow. Many people that use in Prisma wondering why they are asking a data that less than 5% cloud and actually they have more than like sometimes 60% cloud in the image. The reason is that it's because set to core is not sufficiently have a, a good cloud mask. And if they're using it, what you see is also sometimes just dot. So if this is the result from all the area image around it, then you understand why when they say sometimes when they have only 5% cloud, it's actually not 5% cloud, it's actually close to 80% cloud. So sorry for all of us, but this is the case. So whatever is the cloud mass and whatever is the, uh, the method, the, the model that they are using to, to detect those cloud mass, it will influence, uh, of course, enorm enormously, on, on, on what we, we will obtain. The next part 
is the geometric correction, or also we can, as we call it, the map projection. Our image at the moment is in orbit information. So even if we collected information on, on the orbit on the satellite, the only thing that we would be able to do, and this is what Prisma is doing, is to gereference it related to the orbit, or maybe some ground control points that we know, that this is also ASI doing. They have location of different type of in the world that they know the geographic correction, their geographic location, they identify them in the image, and they are correcting them and putting the image actually superimposed into the coordinate. This is the only thing that we are doing in georectification. It means that we would like to uh, superimpose the image into flatten it into a specific coordinate. Most of the time it's it's UTM. It's and this is what I would go Prisma do. The most advanced data provider at the moment, they will use what we call a base image. Imagine that we have a Maxar image in very high resolution, a Google Earth image in very high resolution all over the world. And we will use that, that they already well georeferenced with, uh, with air, uh, air photo and stereo or LiDAR information all over the world. Those are excellent base map with very high resolution. If we will use those data, we will call this image as a master image that is coming from our base mind. Of base, a base map. Those of you that working with QGIS on GIS know it. What we are doing is we're finding a wrapping process. We are finding the slab image and the master image. Again, we're doing in a way a sift process. We identify through the ground point a, a, a link identifying those points in different location. In our case, we are doing it automatically, and we are using again a thin transformation to wrap or superimpose the image on specific location. In, which is the coordinate actually of the master image. Prisma is not doing it. So ASI is not doing it. And those of you that work in Prisma know that uh, the referencing of Prisma is not perfect. You can expect between three to six pixel of distortion, a geographical location distortion, which means that you can expect between 120 approximately to almost 200 meter of, of, of this location. It might be okay if it's in the middle of the scene, it's not important for you. But most of the time when you would like to have a good accurate information over a city or you would like over your agriculture area, you would like to identify and to integrate with other type of information that's coming from the ground, you would need to improve further your uh, georeferencing or uh, to try to find a solution how actually, all, not just to georeference it, but also what we call to rectify. So what I was doing, I was doing uh, georeferencing for the, to, to the image of uh, uh, Barcelona, um, and wh what you see in green, and I'm, I'm sorry if you don't see it so well, in green is actually the base map. I will try to figure out if I see, yeah, you you can see, for example, let me see it here. Yeah, you see the green, so you see the, the rectangle that is just here. You have a shift, I assume, of something close to six pixels between where the base map with the, the right location and the one that you see here with the, the rectangle in white, which is the Prisma image. Now, when we see it after, it's it's already disappeared. And what you see also in the image, that the image become to be sharp and very, very clear. And before it was blurry and, and having like an, an a shadow. However, if you would like accurate information uh, and mainly after atmos good atmospheric correction, the taking into uh, uh, consideration the sun direction. If if you if you're working, for example, or, on them, or you're working in a valley and and you would like to understand why you have a large changes of uh, of illumination along the valley that influence on the spectrum. If uh, for any reason the the um, application that you implement uh, is so sensitive for the topographic of uh, of the data. The right thing and the best accuracy to do uh, is sorry correction to do is to make an auto rectification, which not just taking the orthographic view of the image, which means I just corrected it, flatten it into superimposition of the of the coordinate, but I'm also taking the perspective view, the 3D perspective view, 
and then I'm using team digital elevation model. Most of the, of the data provider will still use the shuttle rather topographic mission, although the resolution is not excellent. It's about between uh, 30 in some area to 100 meter, but uh, flattened one, we can say 100, 100 sorry, kilometer. Uh, you can still have a good auto rectified image uh, corrected, and, and this would be actually the best uh, auto rectification georeferencing of, of your image. Guys, I am again coming back to you just to ask again if you have any questions before I'm diving more uh, into the explanation because I'm sure it starts to be heavy and you start to be hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Michal. Yeah, there are some questions here. So, Okay, cool. I have, I have a practical question. Maybe it's obvious, but I, I have my doubt. <laughs> Um, okay, go ahead. If you, if you will work uh, with a hyperspectral image and you have, for example, to make a classification, it's better to first uh, to make all the operations and uh, geo reference at the end. Uh, how much we distort the spectral if we geo reference at the beginning? Maybe it's obvious, so, but I, I am not no, clear. No, so georeference in itself, georeference in itself, not supposed to change anything in the data. Okay, so the fact that you flatten your information, the pixel into the flat F and into uh, coordinate, not supposed to change it, all the data if you're doing it correctly. Okay, so you can do that. You can do it in the beginning. Uh, all other operation, except of, uh, for, I would say, one geometric correction that you need to do, any operation that you're doing on the data, otherwise you are uh, changing something in the spectrum. So all the other one that I explained and I, I presented, they are changing uh, some information in the, in the spectrum. Some of them will be crucial. You have no other choice. You need to do it like the audiometric correction. Otherwise, you don't know what is the physical parameter or physical flux of, of the information. Uh, but the geometric itself, the geometrics, if you, it's done correctly, it's not supposed at all to change the spectral information. Okay. You're, just you, in, you're just putting the pixel in, in coordinates. This is what you're doing. OK, thank you, thank you. We have more, uh, another question. Okay. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> I have a question on the cloud mask. Alex, you said I'm that there. F mask is the. I know that F mask is uh, good for detecting shadow because it was developed for Landsat. Landsat has exactly. the thermal channel. Then you can estimate the height of the cloud. You can estimate the shadow. But Correct. if you are using, for instance, in case of Sentinel two, do you think is uh, still the best one or? So the one, the example that I'm showing here, and I will show it like a little bit better now, um, is done on hyperspectral, is done on Prisma. And the reason that it's performed better is because it's using the information in each band. So the fact that you have more band, you have more consistency. So the, the cloud will appear in all the bands. So if you have only six bands, it's maybe not enough to identify the cloud. That's why it's not so well performing or 13 in, in using Sentinel-2. But when you're using it in hyperspectral with, uh, with 200, uh, more than uh, 200 bands, you are uh, evaluating the consistency. So that's why F-Mask is quite well performing on Prisma. So you will identify the consistency in the shadow and the consistency in the cloud. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michal. Uh, okay. Any more questions? No? Uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, okay. But I think it's interesting. <laughs> so we can uh, read it. She asked, what is a clear mask? So maybe you can explain a little bit about that. When you show what the is... ah, yeah. that you're creating. No, no, no. Here. So it's it's not a clear mask. It's called. Uh, it's just entering to the process. It's called uh, a, a clear. Sorry, everything that's coming under. It's a, 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 it's a bad. It's a bad abbreviation. So it means clear the mask. So all the snow mask, shadow mask, light has, etc. We call it uh, a clear mask because it's moving between mask itself, the confidence that it's really a mask. So and really a, a a cloud, and then we're removing it. I'm sorry. I had. I had to change it. So it's just a mask. It's not a question of clear mask. It's a mask. And it's all the process here. And when you have a confidence, then what you can do 
that it's really a, that it's really a, a cloud is to remove the cloud. But at the moment, I didn't enter to it. I'm sorry, I, I just didn't change the, the slides. Okay. I didn't change the Excel slide. Sorry for that. Perfect. No problem. Thank you. I think. Guys, uh, sorry. You okay. I'm sorry for this confusion. Thank you very much for your question. Good eyes, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the, the step that is a crucial step. Uh, I think I didn't ask from Alba from some samples, and this is bad because she can tell you how difficult is it uh, when atmospheric correction, mainly on water, body is implemented, how uh, how it can influence strongly on the result. Is a step that is uh, the atmospheric correction, and this is the part when we are now uh, converting the ra radiance to reflectance. So we're removing the atmosphere. So how are we doing it? Imagine that the model of how to study the atmosphere, at least in the top of the atmosphere, and the information through the atmosphere is very is very complex. Why? Because first we have the solar solar radiation as 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 per se, and some of the uh, of the energy will return directly into the satellite, but some of them will scatter due to different type of particle and aerosol in the atmosphere. Some of them will be absorbed by the atmosphere and by the cloud. Uh, some of them will be even uh, absorbed by the uh, uh, sorry by the earth, by the, the the ground, by the soil, and some of them even part of it will be then distributed and reflected back. All this mix of of information is very very difficult to evaluate, and there are many different type of atmospheric, uh, very strong different atmospheric, very complex. They're taking several information like I'm seeing here and in, in considering different paths. The first one is called the solar irradiance, is how much flux come back directly into the sensor. It's trying the path two that you can see here is evaluate how much is diffused through the sky, how much is scattered through different type in free from different type of particle in the different type of level of the atmosphere. How much was reflected by from nearby terrain or nearby terrain and the atmosphere. Everything together is a combination of very strong and large and complicated models. Some of you know probably some of the name, we will arrive to them in a second, like Motan. And those are taken into consideration the total radius in LS, that is the, then of course, the, what is measured at, at the, the top of the atmosphere, plus all the different uh, uh, irradiance and radiance that scatter and collect it in the different path. We will collect total radiance, we collect total radiance from the, that are, but actually the only thing that we are really care about is the total radiance from the target toward the sensor. We would like to have only this information because this is actually presenting the amount of information that you would like to convert to reflectance because this will present actually after the conversion to a spectrum where you can select, you, you can observe and have an insight on the absorption feature of the different type of material, chemical, and physical. So, there are different type of atmospheric technique. There's those that using what we call a relative, relative technique, and there are those that using object in the in the scene itself. So, what they will look most of the time, they will look for black body and uh, sorry, black object on white object in the scene. And they will apply any kind of implementation, it's like a flat field or internal average on it. Uh, some of you know the empirical line when, when you selected like uh, at least minimum five different type of objects that in the scene, uh, dark and bright, and then you're making this type of tabulation between those maximum value. But the very good technique, because it's so complicated, those are the absolute technique like uh, the Motron, like S2, uh, the, the one of saint Helene is actually the base of a six SV. Some of them know the ATCO, some of them were, well, it's a long time, the ATREM. Flash and Quark are based themselves on Motron. And then there is Hatch, which is another uh, method that is developed uh, actually in Python. And those that are, I know to read the PyTorch, uh, PyTorch sorry, they, they actually use it uh, more and more. What is very important to know is that, uh, it's very difficult 
Um, it's uh, many years of study, like uh, Motron was, that was developed by the American Defense developer. It, it's in more than 30 years. They're containing library of a lot of information of a different location and orbit and the incident and a lot of, of study and mathematics behind it. Behind it. Uh, most of the time, the data provider will, be, uh, will count on one of them. I was using specifically uh, uh, for this one, uh, the 6SV. But uh, although we have the flash, and what you see as a result, you see the image that was from Barcelona before atmospheric correction. And already after atmospheric correction, now when I implemented the RGB, I can already uh, what I will visualize it, what we call in, in a real color. So it seems like already the color uh, much more uh, as we know it, at least from the soil, uh, uh, with the, and it's more clear, and all the has and all the other uh, particle information was was uh, removed. The most important is look what happened to radiance. Although the noise, which is coming, of course, uh, in the different places of, of the prisma, uh, you can identify the chlorophyll, the, the peak of the chlorophyll. You can identify the red edge of the vegetation. And of course, uh, the different, what you call the free vegetation, we call it the fingers in the veneer. Uh, the sphere one, of course, the reflection and, and the sphere two. You can separate from water with a peak, of course, in the blue and, and from the one that is uh, from the industrial roof. So now your data is actually in the, in the reflective domain. And this is what you, you can see here on the right image. So the image now is in reflection. Why this is important? This is important because if you have a ground institute data from hyperspectral from the ground, and if you have a spectral library of previous data that you would like, to run on mixing and then to, to compare it for a spectral library, what you will need to do, you will need to work in the reflective domain. It means that you will need then to match the reflective that you uh, collected in the laboratory or in the library to the reflective that you have now after atmospheric correction and to try to identify uh, those features that represent in the material that you are searching for. Do you have a, a, a question here before moving on? Any questions? Okay, Annabella uh, wants to do another question. <laughs> okay, great. No, it's a, it's a question related to uh, which kind of uh, process uh, would uh, Cuba choose to make the atmospheric correction? Uh, we are, we are, it's an excellent question, actually, Annabella. We had today a long uh, I guess called discussion about it. Um, I have to admit and to say that working with so many of them for like in the last 20 years, I'm not sure if I'm still satisfied of any of them together. Uh, but I, I believe that finally, probably uh, Cuba will go for flush. This is uh, my guess because it's uh, based on Moton and they would not uh, develop themselves all the, uh, the process because I think it's very, it's very complicated and it's taking a lot of time. and. And I think the right things to do is probably to move to this direction. But this is my advice to them. I will see further if they will accept it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, um, let's... Uh, there is a question oh, in go. the chat. Oh, it's pleasure. Okay, go ahead. Francisco asks, uh, if, did you, in this case, apply the correction by pixel or by scene? And related to that, how to get the atmospheric parameters to use as input in 6SB from the scene okay. or from external sources? No, so everything is done from solar sources, also in SV. SV, you can integrate, if you wish, uh, also bright uh, bright uh, target or dark target, but everything that I was doing based on the model. So it took into consideration the metadata of the, of the satellite. It's been al already, I knew what was the orbit, I knew uh, other information about the time, the position, the solar angle, and this I was used to, to run the Motron, and then the flash, uh, sorry, and then the, uh, yes, uh, and then the flash for uh, obtaining the result that I show you. So and nothing was now uh, done on uh, anything that is internal from the scene. So it's not based on pixel. Is collecting is is uh, using a transfer model uh, to remove and to to correct the atmosphere. Nothing was related to the scene itself. Only the position. 
Perfect. Ah, and I forgot. I didn't mention something that was important. Uh, a flash gave an option if you wish to integrate digital elevation model. And because I have a digital elevation model, I integrated it. So it's corrected much better illumination in different directions. Perfect. Thank you. And also Francisco says, thank you. <laughs> okay. This is perfect. So we are almost gone. So it's my last slide before I will finish. Um, and I, I, may, I promise that I would not enter too much into this uh, because you have all the afternoon, Antonio, who is like Antonio can explain so well, uh, hyperspectral many and I'm mixing. I would just say that uh, Kuba, for example, and I'm, I guess many of you are moving toward uh, AI-based processing, neural network and deep learning. In our case, it, it almost will be demanded uh, to use deep learning because if you have uh, such a high revisit time, uh, you can imagine the amount of data that we have every day of a specific area, like for example, crop, like every day you measure the, the growth and then with a the long of time, what it will be very important is to, to try to have what we call the learning transfer along the time, along, along the process of, of the acquisition and along the temporal uh, information of the scene itself and the, and the field and the crop, the yield, or any type of other kind of application that you selected. But, I would like to give today is just, if you allow me, something about my profession advice to you. If you would like to use hyperspectral data and you would like to run any kind of algorithm, mainly a neural network and AI, if you don't need to compare it to any spectral library, I'm really urging you, use only the radiometrically corrected data. This is from my experience because any other type of data and implementation that you've done after, except of the, again, the geometrical, as I mentioned before, because this is not supposed to change a lot, would modify and can have the risk to modify the data. Use, take from Prisma only radiometric correction data. First, run your algorithm, and after, if you would like to compare and the results, etc., acquired also uh, the reflective data and, and studied the, the information from the pixel itself. Use the BOA, the bottom of the atmosphere reference cube data, again, as I mentioned, only if it's necessary and only for as a reference or as a spectral library. Prisma data at the moment, as it is with the orbit, is have a very high geometrical distortion. If you really need to uh, superimpose it over a large, a small field or small zone or small crop area or, or urban area, I'm advising you to, to use a shuttle rather topographic mission to, uh, to auto rectify the data and to improve the geo accuracy as much as possible. The last and not least, the available atmospheric model produce good BOA reflected data, but they're doing it, all of them, all the different methods that I show you, very well over land. But when it's over sea and when it's over a large water body, they're somehow performing very poor. The one that, as I mentioned, can say more about it and maybe give some advice about it is ALBA, but I guess many other uh, researchers as well. Um, take into consideration that when you will implement those information from uh, water, uh, you might have to correct it also again uh, through internally for the scene itself and not only based on the model transfer of the atmosphere. 